thank you all for making it this morning. I know sat every Saturday is precious to all of us. <laughs> um, I wanted to start out with a few introductions. I'm glad you guys found the name tag so you remember who you are. But we also have a couple of council members. We have Dave Connect back there, Gary Winterton. Kay Van Buren better show up because his part's at the end. And, <laughs> and, and you guys don't leave until he shows up because <laughs> you may be it at the end. Um, we have our fire chief, Jim Miguel, here and Public Works Director Dave Decker. Um, we're happy to have them helping us out this morning. Um, we have just a few things. Oh, and I also wanted to mention we have two of our youth council members here, Caleb there in the back and Stella up here. We, we've been excited to have the youth council um, in this first year and uh, they're getting ready to, to start accepting applications again for next year's youth council. So um, if you know of high schoolers who are looking for an opportunity to serve, a lot of what they're doing are service projects, but it's been fun for them to learn more about the government as well. And, and you probably saw the pictures of when we went up to the legislature together. That was really fun. Um, and definitely seeing things from a youth perspective um, has helped me a lot as well. They're helping me clue into how the next generation's gonna receive our communications. So first up, we're gonna get an update on the city facilities construction. Um, Scott Henderson couldn't be here, but I'll let him tell you that himself. <laughs> Good morning. Thanks for allowing me to speak to you at the Neighborhood Symposium. I'm Scott Henderson, Parks and Recreation Director, and then recently announced um, Project Director for the new City Center project. I think um, it's important to know that when you're looking at Provo City, we have a, a one-team organization. So when the mayor comes to you and asks you to become involved in the City Center project, you say yes, and, that, and that's because you value what Provo City does, and that is because you want the, the best outcomes possible. Um, I thought that the mayor and the city council and many of the neighborhood chairs showed a great amount of energy and courage looking at this new city center project and helping out our public safety area. Those were uh, those are always tough questions to ask when you're asking a community about um, their taxes and asking for their support. But it's something that when we bring everybody together, um, it's going to be uh, my responsibility then to bring the outcome that this um, community wants. And I want you to know that this process will be very collaborative and there'll be lots of opportunities for the public and for the employees and in each neighborhood to get involved and get progress reports and hear about what we're doing with this new art center. For me on a personal basis, this was a, a, another great opportunity. Uh, since I've been here, I've been involved in the Covey Center construction. I was involved in the Peaks Ice Arena when we took that back over and redid that project. And then obviously I was also a part of uh, the general obligation bond for 39 million for our new recreation center. And maybe I'm close to those projects, but I feel all three of those are very well utilized by our citizens and would really go down as a success story. So we're hoping to get that same outcome out of our city center project. Um, it is really me personally an opportunity to support our police and fire. These are truly our heroes in our community and it's to be part of a project to be able to take them from the facilities they have right now, which we all admit are, are in poor condition, and take them to something where they can really um, excel in a great work environment. That's something that it, it's exciting for me to be part of and that's gonna motivate me every day on this. So right now on the status of the project, we are assembling the team that will be part of helping us both design and construct this. We've conducted interviews for our architects, so we'll um, compile our scores and find out who will be the architect for this project. 
and then we bring in the contractor fairly early on this process and they are sitting with us there to be able to do estimating and construction management with us during the design so they can make sure what we're designing can actually be built here. So it's something that it's, it's great to have that team together, then that works towards a final cost and a final design and then we start in on construction on this. So it's uh, my goal upon every one of these projects is to, to deliver what the public and now what our city employees and our police chiefs deliver what they want and then also give them things at the end that they never could have dreamed of. And I, that's something, a standard that you know, I think we met here at the rec center in that we gave people things that they never would have known that they wanted, but they sure are enjoying right now. So thank you again for this opportunity to speak to you. I look forward to meeting all of you. If Karen would have told me a little earlier, I would have been at the meeting. I did schedule a trip to watch March Madness, but if I could have been at the neighborhood symposium, that might have beat out this sporting event. But uh, travel arrangements were already booked, so thank you very much and have a great day. Just, just judging by the things on the wall of his office, you know that this would not have beat out any sporting event. <laughs> One more thing. I, um, we filmed that like a week or two ago, and um, and I believe since then the architect has been selected. Am I right on that, Chief? Uh, have you heard they, on that? Yeah, they, they have been selected, but they're we're not under contract. Oh, okay. And then um, the as far as I'm aware, the first project that is going to be worked on is Fire Station Two. More work had been done on that. Um, to get it going already so and it's about a year from completion the estimate, the estimate that we just got from, uh, from the architect was that it's possible that we could open it in August of 2020 which is pretty amazing considering that we're, we're uh, currently in March of 19 so they tell us that uh, four to five months to get everything drawn up and, and get ready to go. We've got uh, probably legitimately a month worth of demo, uh, demolition that we've got to do. There's some things that have to be done before we can demolish the building. And then uh, construction will start and they say that we can count on an eight to nine month construction period, which I, I thought was pretty aggressive, but we're certainly excited to hear it. Um, one thing that you will see fairly soon, and we talked about this in the bond election, is that we are relocating station two. Station 2 currently, uh, it's, its current site, along with the property next door to it, is going to be this, the site of new fire station number 2. So we are actually uh, going to need a temporary location, and that's going to be up at the park site on, on Canyon Road, um, roughly the 3800 block of Canyon Road, 38, 3900 block of Canyon Road, uh, on that, on that uh, piece of property that right now, right now probably, I haven't seen it, but it probably has your dumpsters on it. Uh, for the neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood cleanup project that they do, but uh, we'll be relocating up there. We'll have a, a large membrane structure and um, a, for lack of a better term, a mobile home that will be up there. Um, we will we'll get that moved up, get moved in, and then uh, because this thing, this thing actually uh, by late summer, uh, we're going to be tearing a building down and starting to put in foundations for the new building. So. That's, that's the progress that you'll see fairly quickly up on Canyon Road. So, sorry, do you put up a front park outside of Canyon No, there'll be, we will have a, a large, um, it's the, the best way I can describe it is a membrane structure. It'll be 60 feet long, 40 feet wide, with two roll doors. And uh, they do this quite, uh, it's quite common when, when, they, when they have to, when, sometimes when they're building a new fire station, in emergency situations where they have to get something established, and sometimes when they've either condemned or, um, for instance, they did this a lot during some of the earthquakes in California, uh, they condemned the fire station, they very nearby put up the membrane structure in a, and a, uh, a mobile home, for lack of a better term, and then uh, uh, 
So, and, and we are just leasing that, we're just leasing the mobile home. So uh, just as soon as we're done, they'll take it back and uh, lease it to someone else. So, but, but we are, um, now that I'm seeing a timeline and uh, I, I I'm, can't, could not, cannot tell you how excited we are to see the progress being discussed. So thank you very much. So next up we have a road construction update from Dave Decker. And I'm sure you've noticed we have road construction. <laughs> My name is Dave Decker, I'm over uh, Public Works and uh, I want to, before I start on the road construction, I want to express my appreciation to uh, the neighborhood chairs and to uh, the council members. Um, many of you know um, we have had some pretty uh, difficult conversations about funding different, uh, different kinds of projects. The council has been very supportive, the neighborhood chairs we oftentimes rely on communicating um, uh, things that are going on, uh, particularly relative to construction, and um, and I just want to express my appreciation to to all of you uh, coming today and the, and the help that Public Works especially receives from the neighborhood chair. When Cliff contacted me a couple of weeks ago about coming, he he talked to me, uh, asked me to cover a couple of road construction projects. I asked him about uh, two or three other major things that are going on in Public Works. And he said, if you've got some time, go ahead and do that. So I'm open to any or any questions that you might have on, on projects that you're seeing that I don't necessarily cover today. But um, um, let me cover what I was asked to, and then, and then I'll open it up to, to questions. So two projects, two road construction projects that I was asked to cover. The first one is 500 West. You probably noticed it's, a, it's under construction already. Um, and the, and the main part of the construction is from Center Street up to 500 North. Um, it's a UDOT project, um, that's a UDOT road, and it is a two construction season project. That's, uh, that's um, probably good to note as you communicate with your uh, neighborhood uh, neighborhoods. So it's an 18 month process, so this first construction season, it's just the beginning, uh, unfortunately and um, it's, a, it's going to be a long project. Now you may be asking what they're doing, why are the orange cones south of Center Street? Most of that work is utility work, so because of where that, that road sits, we're actually replacing many of the utilities. So south of Center Street, it's mostly a storm drain that we're replacing in that road. It's gonna be on the west side of, of 500 West, down to about 500 South. Um, and uh, we're replacing the storm drain. It's a large storm drain, 36, 42 inch storm drain on that road. And then in the main part of the, of the construction uh, from Center Street to 500 North, we're replacing a sewer line and a water line. So that's part of the, the, uh, the extension of, of the road. We don't want to put a brand new road down and a couple of years later we rip it up because of utilities. So, um, and the storm drain goes north of Center Street as well. So there's a lot of utility work uh, associated with that. There's a few things that will actually happen north of 500 North, um, up, in, up, up to the point where it's uh, impacting the hospital and, and some other things, but it's not nearly as intrusive as uh, you know the Center Street to 500 North segment. And there'll be uh, the, the basic, um, part of that construction is replacing the roadway, but the curb and gutter on both sides are being replaced. Uh, the sidewalk on the east side is being widened out. I think it's, a it's an eight or a 10 foot sidewalk. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a nice improvement on, on 500 West. And, but, but it is, it's gonna be painful. I'll, I'll just tell you, it's, it's a, a major impact to traffic. Obviously it's used for a lot of people commuting, uh, community, uh, community into a uh, Provo, and uh, I just encourage people to I just encourage people to find a different route. Don't use 500 West. Uh, the other project that I was asked to cover today is Bulldog, and there's a picture up here of uh, Bulldog. Uh, this is from State Street or 500 West over to Canyon Road, um, and. Uh, again, this one's under construction. The orange cones are already out. Uh, the main part of this uh, project is uh, taking one lane on the outside of each, uh, each side of the road 
and we're going to convert that into a, uh, what they call a protected bicoin. You can kind of see it in the, in, the, uh, in the photo here. So there's actually going to be almost like two park strips. Um, and the bike lane will be in between those two park strips. And so we'll end up with um, two lanes in each direction. The other component of this road uh, construction is to put medians, center medians, in most of the roadway. If you can picture that road, there's lots of driveways, there's lots of people coming out and making left turns across the road. Um, when we started looking at this, um, uh, Bulldog has, uh, UDOT reported that Bulldog has the highest um, accident rate um, in the state. And I was a little surprised by that, by that uh, statistic, but just uh, given all the different variety of, of, of issues that we have there, um, um, I, they, they, they came back, and again, UDOT and MAG has been involved with this. MAG, this is actually funded through MAG. Um, the city does have um, a small uh, match that we have to do on Bulldog. Luckily, this is a one construction season project, so this is, uh, this is going to take place just this year, this, uh, this summer, when we anticipate it being completed sometime in October, early November of this year. There are a few utilities. We're uh, doing some improvements on stormwater. There's a couple of spots where some sewer is going to be uh, improved, but it's a, overall, it's a, it's a smaller project. So those were the two things that I was specifically asked to cover. I don't know, um, let me cover two other items why I'm here and then I'll open it up to questions. So I mentioned to Cliff, I said we probably ought to cover the treatment plant, uh, an update on the treatment plant. Uh, we, we talked about this last year. And as, as many of you know, um, we are facing uh, kind of an increase, in fact a pretty significant increase in state regulations, uh, mostly in what they call nutrients. There's really two nutrients that the state of Utah is worried about, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen um, in the effluent or the, the water that's released from the treatment plant and just water that's going into Utah Lake particularly. And they have started ramping up regulations and this started years ago. This was, I mean, this was first announced somewhere in the neighborhood of the, uh, the year 2000. And um, as, as we've gotten closer, the state's gotten a little bit more aggressive. They came to us um, several years ago and said, here's the first set of regulations. And they said, by 2020, you have to meet those regulations. And they said, then they said, oh, by the way, there's probably going to be a second step, set of regulations somewhere in the year of 2030. And you ought to be planning about those second set of regulations. And so as we started going to the council and talking about those regulations, I, I got really concerned about doing some short-term um, you know, fixes for the first set of regulations. We probably could have met the first uh, set of regulations fairly easily. When I say that, it still would have cost uh, uh, quite a bit of money. But it would have been a very short-term fix. In 2030, we would have been, uh, we would have been in a mess um, and, and facing a bigger issue. So I made the recommendation to the city council to take a much bigger step um, uh, than just meeting the 2030 regulations. And the treatment plant that is being, um, and we've gone through this process, uh, we ended up going to the state last fall and asking the state for a loan. Um, and, and we asked for about $120 million from the state. And uh, the DEQ board uh, that authorizes the money did not have that much money. They ended up giving us about $78 million. Um, but it, um, it, it put us in a position where uh, we could uh, made, basically rebuild our, our treatment plant. That, that loan that they gave us, um, it's a fairly generous loan. The interest rate on it is 0.5%. Over the 20 year repayment that we, um, that we pay back that $78 million, the interest, the total interest on it is about $4 million, just a tad over $4 million. So that's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty good loan, I think, from the state. You might mention half of that is given back. Two million is, you don't have to pay back. There is, there is a $2 million um, loan forgiveness is what they call it. Um, and so again, they, they basically gave us money uh, to, to rebuild the treatment plan. 
and and it and, and they felt they felt very good. The board felt very good about the the the, the, the direction that we were going, uh, the recommendation that we were making to our city council, and again, not just looking at the 2020 regulations, but the 2030 regulations. Um, I can give you the numbers. I don't know if it makes any difference to you. Um, it's a it's a bunch of chemical stuff, but. Um, on uh, phosphorus, they were giving us a regulation in 2030 of one milligram per liter, and in 2030, they have estimated, they haven't ironed it out uh, exactly, but they're giving us a range of zero point, or excuse me, 0 0.4 to 0 0.1 milligrams uh, per liter. So it's, gonna, it's going to be a magnitude of 10 uh, decrease in, in phosphorus uh, in 2030. Uh, nitrogen, somewhere in the range, um, they're telling us right now about 10 milligrams per liter and it may drop below 10 milligrams per liter. And again, I know those chemicals don't make a lot of uh, sense to, to some people, but they're basically just fertilizer. When you go to shop, or when, when you go and buy fertilizer at your hardware store, you're, you're basically buying nitrogen and phosphorus. That's what you're putting on your front lawns. And uh, it runs off. Um, it, it, it can come off in stormwater. It also comes out of our treatment plant. Um, and right now, our treatment plant is discharging about two to three milligrams per liter. And that first set again is one milligram per liter. So, Dave, please. So, when I think about the regulations and how strict they are getting, I, I kind of joke that eventually they want us to put out drinking water. It's getting it's getting really close, um, and and the and the conversations that we're having with the state, it's not just about those two chemicals. They're also talking about they mentioned in their reports to the federal EPA, they mentioned uh, Provo Bay ammonia issues in Provo Bay are a concern to them. They're talking about uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, so in our effluent right now, when people uh, take aspirin or all kinds of medicine. Um, part of that medicine eventually makes its way to the treatment plant, and if the treatment plant is not um, is not prepared to be able to remove pharmaceuticals from the effluent, those pharmaceuticals end up in the effluent or or the water that's discharged from the uh, from the from the uh, treatment plant, and it ends up back in some body of of, of water. And right now, our treatment plant's discharging into the Provo Bay, and so. As, as those conversations proceed with the state and the federal EPA, um, I started getting you know, really concerned about just looking at the short-term regulations. And, and I just, I, I went back to the council and said, we're gonna spend some money on the first set of regulations, but we're gonna spend a lot more on the second set of regulations if we're not careful. Um, and so I just made a recommendation Let's build a treatment plant that uh, goes after the second set of regulations just right now. We're probably going to be money ahead um, if, if we do that. We had a, a large team uh, looking at this. This was not just public work staff by any means. So anyway, we've, we've gone back to the council, uh, obtained this loan, um, and essentially uh, we are proceeding with designing what they call an MBR treatment plant. It's a membrane bioreactor. It's, it's one of the, if not the most advanced uh, treatment plant. Um, it's utilized in the west, uh, western United States in several locations, Texas, uh, Arizona, Southern California, all have uh, integrated uh, this type of treatment plant. And it will be a very advanced treatment plant. Uh, really moving along those lines, as you know, Dave, uh, Dave Connect indicated, uh, getting really quite close to drinking water. Now there's no, there's no plan to put it in the drinking water. Um, uh, in some cases, Arizona and Southern California, they've gone to that point where your, your treatment plant water actually goes right back into your drinking water system. That is not the plan in Provo. Uh, there's really no need to do that either. And I'm not sure that the state of Utah is really prepared for that conversation yet. Um, but I, I think at some point uh, that might uh, start to be a conversation in the state of Utah, but that's, uh, that's not the plan right now. Um, right now, the conversation with the, with the council is taking either that effluent or other water rights. So we have water rights right now in the Provo River uh, that are not fully utilized and taking um, multiple sources of water and doing what we call ASR. That stands for Aquifer Storage and Recovery. 
So right now, the, the, the city operates about 16 culinary water wells, and they're basically deep shafts that go to the ground, um, anywhere from about 200, uh, 250 feet to 700 feet. In fact, one of our wells is about 1,000 feet down. And we're taking water, groundwater, out of the, uh, out of the uh, ground almost year-round in some cases. And, um, and we're concerned about that aquifer, so that, that aquifer, that water, doesn't magically appear. That water actually comes from the mountains, the snowpack, and it naturally uh, uh, penetrates through the rocks and in the, in the foothills of the, of the city, and it recharges every single year. So this year we've got a great snowpack, and you'll see those aquifer levels actually start to increase. But, but, but before this year, we've had a series of long drought years. Um, you know, we go five, six, seven years in a row with the drought, and those aquifer levels start to drop, and we can actually monitor. We have equipment in the ground at each of those wells, and we monitor the level of the aquifer. And uh, we have data going back into the early 70s, 1970s, um, on aquifer. And as you, you know, obviously as the snowpack changes, those aquifer levels change, but we're seeing a decline <coughs> overall in the aquifer. There's, there's years like this year, again, we'll see a, an increase, but overall we're seeing a decline in the aquifer. And our concern is um, at some point the state may come back, and we've seen this in, in other parts of the state where the state will come back and say, you cannot continue to use water rights and, and what they call mining the aquifer. You're, you're depleting the, the natural water uh, in a long period of time. So the plan right now is to artificially recharge the aquifer and uh, projects that we may be identifying um, in the next couple of years with the council, probably in the foothills of Provo Canyon, Rock Canyon, Slate Canyon, things like that, we'll be utilizing to try to artificially recharge the, the aquifer. And, and I think it's a great resource. You, you have to realize Provo City has really good water rights. It's one of the things that has been uh, really uh, almost top notch um, as far as uh, uh, Provo City. But um, you can have all the water rights you want, but if the, if the water is not at the location um, you know, where that water right says it's supposed to be, you can't take the water out. And so if you, if you continue to deplete that aquifer and the water's not there, eventually those water rights will become less and less valuable. So please, there's two questions here. Go first. How do you artificially uh, infuse the water into So we have, we have a consulting team on board right now actually identifying locations where water can, and, and, and it works almost like nature does it. So when you, when you walk Rock Canyon, I've walked it a couple of times, not during spring runoff, because spring runoff has enough water coming down it that it'll push it to the mouth of the canyon, but if you walk Rock Canyon where it does have some water coming down, uh, but not during spring runoff, you'll notice that the water oftentimes will not make it to the mouth of the canyon. There's several locations in that canyon where the water just disappears in the ground. Where's it going? It's, it's generally going into our aquifer, and that's what we're studying right now. Uh, there may be other places like uh, the gravel pit that the, the Provo City owns in Provo Canyon, uh, where we can have water sit out on the gravel pit and actually just dissipate into the ground, and that's recharging uh, the aquifer. And so we'd be putting water out into those locations and trying to get our aquifer to, to artificially recharge. There's a project right now, um, a lot of people don't know about it, but up in North Utah County, they actually did a study uh, several years ago and they identified a similar problem. The state of Utah actually came into the north end of Utah County and uh, have put in some uh, pretty tight restrictions on city in the north end of the county as far as aquifer depletion. So those cities got together and they said, let's try some aquifer storage or recovery projects. So the mouth of American Fork Canyon, if you drive out of that canyon, right, um, there's a golf course uh, right at the north end of the golf course. There's a large gravel area, right? Uh, American Fork uh, Creek runs right through this golf course. And they actually have a small dam and they, they store some water there with the same idea where they're just holding the water and they just let it fall through the rocks basically and they're trying to restore, um, uh, put, put water into the aquifer. 
And so it's the same type of a process that we'll be doing in, in Provo. And it will, it will happen in multiple locations. This is not going to be a one location uh, project. So, Beth, did you have another question? Uh, I do. Um, when you're recharging the aquifer, then this kind of goes out to West Provo and uh, complaints and issues that the farmers have had. As we're looking to develop West Provo, I, if you're recharging the aquifers, the ground level water out there, is that going to be raised and come back up? So you have to understand, and I apologize, I've deviated quite a bit from the treatment plant here, but on aquifers, you have to understand that um, as Lake, um, I'll do a really quick geology here, um, as Lake Bonneville, um, you know, that used to fill the Salt Lake, Utah, County Valleys, um, as it receded, it deposited a certain amount of clay um, in, into um, the, 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 the aquifer. And so when we talk about when we talk about aquifer water that we're drinking out of the aquifer, it's it's again 250 to 750 feet in the ground. But between the the surface of the ground and our aquifer, there's lots and lots of clay. And we call that a confined aquifer so that it's protected. So when we when we walk when we're putting water into the foothills, it's actually going through the rocks and getting into this deep aquifer. It's not influencing that that shallow groundwater that you're talking about. So it's a very different water level um, that, that we're talking about. We're trying to get that and that's why we go where we're going. That's why we go into the mountains, the, the foothills, is because we're trying to find that path of rock and get underneath that sediment that Lake Bonneville look, uh, left on the surface. So, Dave? Do they ever put some kind of marker or tracer in the water so they can say, we put it in up here and it came out way down there? You can put ions, you can put some trace uh, uh, chemical in it. Um, um, right now we probably would not do that. Um, we can see enough influence in, in the aquifer um, uh, so we can tell. And by the way, I can tell you right now, the studies that we've done so far, this is, this is not new concepts. Um, when we drill a well, we, we do basically the same type of study. It sometimes will take 10 to 20 years for water to, to, to come in, uh, you know, from the foothills, from the mountains, into some of our wells, especially the ones that are further out on the west side. So it takes years and years to, 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 you know, to, to, to see the actual water. Now some people will say, well, why, why do this if it takes so long? Well, the, the, the difference is, is you're trying to make, you're, you're almost pressurizing the aquifer um, underneath. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than I probably have the time to, to do today. But it will make a difference long term for the city. Please. So are you talking about, sorry, get your kids. You're talking about putting water up there to rebuild the aquifers you're talking about. Is that the water or how it back up? Potentially, yes. Absolutely, you could. So the treatment plant, the reason the ASR is tied to the treatment plant is the conversation that we're having with the state is using part of the effluent or, again, other water rights out of the Provo River and actually pumping that, uh, that water to the foothills and letting it sit out on, you know, some rock someplace and letting it, you know, go through the filtration process in the aquifer. So, yes, that is exactly how it's tied together with the treatment plant. And where is the current water treatment plant? Where is the proposed new water treatment plant? And my last, I'm wondering, did you say that there's some kind of connection between the water treatment plant and that Ulta Utah Lake? And if so, how is that? So the current treatment plant is in East Bay. Um, so do you know do you know where the golf course is for the city down uh, by the old Nobel Building? The treatment plant sits just east of the Nobel Building. And, um, and we had looked at two different sites. We had actually done a site um, study for four different sites for the treatment plant. It really came down to two treatment plant uh, sites that were most feasible. One was out by the airport, one was at the existing treatment plant. If we had gotten the entire amount of the request of the loan from the, from the state, we likely would have gone to the airport site. But given the financial constraints that we have right now, we're recommending to the council that we stay at the existing treatment plant. So we're going to rebuild what they call the hydraulic side of the treatment plant. The solid side of the treatment plant will basically stay in, intact. And that's why we're using the existing treatment plant is because we needed, we needed a little bit more money in order to build the, in, the entire brand new treatment plant. 
And so we're basically rebuilding the hydraulic side. So that's where we control the phosphorus and the nitrates that discharge into Utah Lake. And the discharge right now goes into what they call the mill race. The mill race actually goes through the golf course, and and the mill and and the discharge from the new treatment plant will continue to go through uh, the mill race into the into the golf course, and that eventually goes out into the Provo Bay and into Utah Lake. Make sense? Please. Have you decided where you're going to do that parallel 36 yet? Are you going to run it down the Parkway, or do you? So the, so, the, so the 36 inch that you're talking about, uh, Becky, that will parallel the existing 36 so that it'll come down 1600 west and follow the exact same pattern um, out, uh, out to the treatment plant. When you get closer to that, can you do a neighborhood meeting? We will. Neighborhood <laughs> we will. Thank you. We absolutely will. There was another question right here in the front. Oh, I just have a question. So you mentioned earlier about it, like in the future, being changed to where it would just Drinking water. How far in the future would you say that could go? Well, they, as, as I indicated, in Arizona and Southern California, they've already done that. Um, and, um, you know, Provo, Provo could potentially build what they call advanced water treatment next to the treatment plant and make that happen. And we're actually having some internal conversations about doing that, mostly to use. Um, a treatment plant that would treat our Provo River water. Um, and so, as I indicated, right now we're not fully utilizing those water rights out of the Provo River. So, we could potentially do that, you know, five, maybe ten years out in Provo. And that doesn't mean that we're going to be treating the effluent necessarily to those standards, but it may allow us to use the Provo River water rights. Um, and, and, and I don't know how many people know this, but that's exactly the same process that, that Central Utah Water uh, does. Uh, we don't get very much of our water from Central Utah in Provo, but most of Utah County, many, many of the cities in Utah County, they rely almost 100% on Central Utah Water. And right now, they take it out of the river, they take it to a treatment plant that's in Orem City, they treat it there, and then distribute it to cities throughout Utah County. So we're basically talking about the same process with our Prover water rights. So we could potentially be doing that, you know, within five to ten years, something like that. So I've taken a lot more than ten minutes. Um, let me cover one other project that I that I mentioned to Cliff, um, and um, and I, up until last week, this was really kind of a questionable project. Um, the airport uh, terminal, um, most of you have probably read in the newspaper, we had gone to um, uh, the state legislature. We started talking with the uh, mayor's office um, last fall before the legislative session started. And um, we had some reasons to think that we might be able to get some traction uh, regarding a, 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 an airport terminal. And uh, so the mayor gave us some direction. She, she asked Isaac Paxman, who is her deputy, to uh, kind of head up some requests. He went to the state legislature, um, some representatives uh, at the state level. We went to the county as well and made two requests. And um, up until last week, we really didn't know quite what was going to happen with these requests. And we were a bit surprised, but pleasantly surprised, that both requests at the county and the state level were um, were authorized, fully authorized, no less. So from the state legislature, we received $9 million, uh, a little bit over $4 million from Utah County, and it will mostly fund a brand new terminal. We have some obligations from the city side as far as utilities and some other infrastructure that needs to be built. But as of just about a week, a week and a half ago, um, we are quickly putting a team together um, and uh, moving forward on a, a brand new airport terminal. I have a couple of rend uh, renderings if somebody's interested in looking at it. Um, I know there's some neighborhoods that are a little bit nervous about what the, what the terminal looks like and obviously we'll start to engage neighborhoods a lot more. Um, again, up until a week and a half ago, we really didn't know whether this was going to happen or not. All of a sudden we've been given the green light on it. Very quickly, uh, the terminal is planned right now to have four gates. Um, we have a two-gate terminal right now, but really not enough room on the apron. What they, it's the parking spot basically for the for the airplanes. 
at the terminal. We really don't have a, a, a large amount of room there. And uh, the terminal, the brand new terminal, will be at the south end of the airport. Um, we, we have uh, $8 million grant from the FAA uh, for the apron itself coming in 2020. So right now the goal is to have a terminal potentially opening uh, by the year, uh, by fall of 2020. And uh, so we'll, we'll need to move pretty quickly on this project and, and, and uh, move it along, please. Um, just so that everybody understands, you're not, re you're not held to requirement 4498 uh, uh, elevation, minimum uh, 4096 minimum elevation. So nobody in the city should be surprised that if we in fact do have a large flood, the airport's going under. So the, the thing about the airport, and, and this is a little bit different area of public works, I haven't really touched on this today, but, but we are, we are, we have a dike system around uh, the airport to protect. And a moat. <laughs> yeah, moat and a dike. Um, but the, the problem that we have right now with all of our dikes, and this is not unique to the airport, none of them are certified um, from um, the Corps, uh, Army Corps of Engineers on the federal level. Okay. Can I and, just say something about that real quick? Because that's been a really big hot topic on the west side. Yep. Because we had the dikes there, they were certified. It wasn't until after Hurricane Katrina when they changed the certification that they were decertified from dikes. So technically, they were dikes, and they do have functionality. They're just not certified right now. Yep. And, and, and we're, we're going back and forth. This is a whole different conversation in public works. Um, uh, but we're going back and forth with the Army Corps of Engineers and with several people at the, at the state emergency uh, level and, and kind of having this conversation about flood insurance for residents versus the dike system because we've got this reality of, you know, the Provo River, even last year on the spring runoff, I think it was last year, we saw some very high levels coming down the Provo River, and yet, um, and, and the dikes functioned pretty well. We had a couple of issues with them, but overall the dikes worked quite well on the Provo River. And yet, when they come back and say, well, we're gonna create the floodplain maps for the Provo River, they're basically ignoring the fact that they have dike systems along the Provo River, because they're not certified. And so, we have this reality issue, if I can say it that way, we have a reality issue with the Corps of Engineers because they're kind of saying, well, we don't think you've got a dike system on the west side, and we're saying, you know what, we, we really do, whether you want to call it certified or not, that's, you know, you can, you can debate that, but, so, so we've got a long-term issue with the Army Corps of Engineers, and even our state uh, FEMA people, um, we're, we're having a, a hard debate with them. I just understood that you got, I, I know the reasoning behind that you are building below the, the 4496 uh, requirement. Yep. I, I understand that. I just wanted to make sure everybody else knew that there are, you do have something mitigated, but if in fact uh, there, that you're not in compliance, mm -hmm. you know, and that's so that people aren't pointing at the airport and saying, well, you don't have to, you know, the whole argument. It is. It's, it, there's, and we may, we may go down the path, we may be forced to go down the path of certification on a few of the dikes as well, okay. so. Thank you. Please, what there's a couple of them. What, what has to happen? The easy answer, the quick answer, is you bring in a consulting engineering firm that goes through and, and goes through the process to certify the dike. They're basically looking at how the dike was built and if there's vegetation on the dike, because if root systems can work their way through the dike, that means the water can work their way through, work, uh, its way through the dike. So basically, you have to, there's a long process to certify it. Excuse me, the, the, the FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers have, we've estimated based on the certification that it would cost several million dollars to have somebody come in and certify even just the airport itself. That doesn't, that doesn't include the Provo River dikes and the you know, other <coughs> dikes are on the west side. So we're looking at a pretty large expense in order, in, in order to certify all the dikes. And some of them are gonna have some challenges. You know, if you walk the Provo River dikes, a lot of them have trees and things like that. So in order to certify those dikes, all the trees would have to be removed from the dikes on, on the Provo River. So that's, that's really the kind of the process. And it's not an easy one. And a very expensive Thank one. Thank you. Please, there's. I just, I had this in question, Tara, but I know we've had this conversation several times. But on the west side, people look at those dikes as 
they remember the flood and they don't want that to happen again in their house. Mm -hmm. And so it is just very important that we don't take them down, even for perception purposes. Or not. Because I do have people that want to take them down because they're in their backyards. He, he's not the one you talk to. It's that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm talking to y'all. <laughs> it's a very strong feeling, especially in my neighborhood, that those dikes remain in place. And I do have some that do own partial of them that want them out because they want their backyards bigger. So I have to apologize. I've deviated significantly from. Uh, from what I intended, but if there's any questions on those four projects or other projects in you know related to public works, if it's construction related, I'm probably the guy that's uh, to be blamed on on construction of the city. So um, I'd be happy to answer any other questions that you might have. So. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll hold the area meeting. <laughs> just just us. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So the neighborhood advisory board, the last time we met, um, we talked about potential topics for this meeting, and this is one that came up was emergency preparedness. Now the city has an emergency manager, um, Chris Blinzinger, who often is known as Cool Chris, because Blinzinger is a tough name to rattle off. Um, he is occupied today with more emergency training type stuff but um, he sent a very qualified substitute here today. Chief Miguel um, is gonna to talk to you about some things you can do within your neighborhood. I did wanna point out, while some cities do have a network system within their neighborhoods where the city would reach out to neighborhood chairs and the neighborhood chairs do some organized effort in their neighborhoods, we don't have our neighborhood program set up that way. Um, you're, you're, not on the hook as as organizing something in your neighborhood but because you are kind of the ambassadors from the city to the residents in your area it's good to know what resources are out there how we can be prepared and where we can go for the answers and there's an amazing amount of information out there and um, and how we receive notifications has changed over the years uh, we used to rely on the sirens blasting I don't know if you've realized over probably the last five to ten years there are a lot of buildings you can't even hear those sirens in so there have been a lot of changes and Chief Miguel is going to touch on that and some other things you can do well good morning if it's okay with you I'm going to stand here rather than back there at that microphone that feels very weird to me but um, just it's a long ways away from you. Um, the, the first thing that, uh, as, as, I, as I listen to Scott and talk to you a little bit about the fire station and then listen to Dave Decker about some of the things that are happening, it's an exciting time to be in Provo. Um, there, there are a lot of really exciting things happening and I think that, um, that we, sit, we sit in an example of what can happen when the community comes together and, and uh, builds a community resource. And so it's an exciting time. And, and I, I probably shouldn't say this, maybe this is inappropriate, but it's Saturday and, uh, and uh, technically I'm, I should, I'm not working today. So uh, I want to, th on, from the fire department, um, I want to thank you for, uh, whether, whether you supported the bond or did not support the bond personally, you gave us the venue to talk to the community. We were able to come to your neighborhood meetings. We were able to, you, you gathered them together for the, for the listening tour. And uh, we had an opportunity to talk to the community, to get to know you, to get to know what your concerns were, to hear your input. And uh, um, I don't have to tell you how grateful I am that the bond was successful. And I promise you that, uh, that it is going to have a tremendous positive impact for the fire department, and, and I, you know, one of my favorite things to do is, is to speak for the police chief, especially when he's not here. <laughs> but uh, but uh, on behalf of Chief Ferguson and myself, um, it is it is a wonderful time to be a firefighter or a police officer in in uh, the city of Provo, and, and so I offer our sincere thanks to you for for the opportunity and and for what you what you've agreed to do for us. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I come with I come with some information, not so much a class or a, or um, 
but I, I come with some opportunities that I'm hopeful that we will be able to distribute throughout the, the neighborhood chair program and, um, and some kind of exciting things that are happening. Um, first of all, we continue twice a year to offer our community emergency response training. Um, we do that, it's a six week course, it's t typically an evening. The, the one interesting thing that we do is that we've made it flexible. We work with, we work with uh, the city of Orem and with Wasatch County and we, we kind of try to do a, a class together. Orem will teach the same thing one night a week that Provo will teach another night of the week. So it makes it a little bit more flexible. If you, if you can't be on a Wednesday night to Provo, you can go on a Tuesday night to Orem and hear the exact same information from sometimes the exact, excuse me, the exact same instructor. So we encourage you, we, we think that the CERT program, um, it's a nationwide program. There have been hundreds and hundreds of people trained in Provo and we think it is, a, uh, it is, it is wonderful education for you to first take care of yourself and your family, second, reach out to your neighborhood, and third, if, if both of those have been accomplished during a, an emergency, the third thing is, is to actually come and be part of the greater good and be put to work as part of, a, as part of um, the city system. So um, this, this site that you're seeing here, this emergency management site, that is on the provo.org. You can, you can get to that just by typing in Provo Emergency Management or just going to the fire department and, and that is one of the pages in the fire department. It has all of this information on it um, and, and where to sign up. Um, I've, got a, I've got a phone number. I see a lot of people taking notes. If you have any interest in any of this stuff that I'm about to tell you and you can't find it on the website, it should be there, but if you can't find it, yes? I'm curious what, um, how we get these classes during the day. Um, we, we could absolutely do that. We could absolutely do that. There's, um, if, if we could... Um, I think it's been a while since we've actually inquired of people as to whether they would be willing to come during the day. Quite frankly, the day's easier for us. And, and I mean, it, it, it makes it a lot simpler. So we will, um, I will take that back. I'll take that back to Chris. I've talked to Chris about it. He's just kind of, well, we need this much to carry. And then well, and that's true. But, but unless we ask, unless we advertise and ask, and we can advertise through you, Unless we advertise and ask, we don't know whether we can put 20 people in a room. And really, we only need 16 people in a room. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not just about getting 16 people in a room. There are exercises that we do, and there are things, and, and we can't, can't do them unless we have enough players to participate. So, but I promise you that Chris, Chris and I meet on Monday mornings, and I promise you I'll bring that to Chris. Um, because if we can fill it, it would be wonderful to do, wonderful to do. Uh, so CERT is one is one opportunity uh, that we hope you'll take advantage of. Yes. How many weeks or hours? It is um, it is four hours a night for six, uh, three to four hours a night for six weeks, and it culminates typically it culminates. Chris right now is uh, on a they have a Saturday drill that they do. Typically, they get together with, with the people from Orem, Wasatch County. They come and we, uh, the last time they did a drill, I think, we went to Wasatch County and did a large area search drill. I honestly can't tell you what they're doing today. I, he told me, but I can't remember. Um, we've had uh, a, dr a, dr a drill in our parking garage downtown, um, a collapse drill down there. So they do some pretty fun things. And how often do you recommend? Well, they're, they're, the recertification is, is coming, you're able to come to any class that you would like to come to. Once you get the certification, you're, you're certified, if you will. You'll get a certificate. And, um, and then if you want to come to CPR night or you want to come to first aid night or you know, something like that, you're welcome to come just, just by calling in. Find, if you find out what nights they are, you're welcome to show up. And periodically they do a refresher. I don't know when the last time Chris has done a refresher, but that's another thing that we'll talk about about, about doing a doing a couple of a couple of uh, uh, couple of night or maybe a Saturday refresher. Um, the second thing that we've begun is uh, there, there's a nationwide campaign called Stop the Bleed, and and we we have begun to teach Stop the Bleed, and and we've taught. 
many, many, many people so far, and it seems to be a very popular class for a couple of reasons. One is it takes it's an hour long, and the second one is that it is, it is an incredible skill. We have learned through some of our, unfortunately, our mass tragedies, we have learned that, um, that many lives could have been saved had we just stopped the bleed. Had we just been able to, um, had we just been able to go in and pack a wound, uh, pack a gunshot wound, and just oh man, pack a gunshot wound, really? Um, yeah, pack a gunshot wound, pack a knife wound, pack a you know, be able to wrap and, and stop a, a serious evulsion or something like that. Um, the body can do amazing things, but it can't function without volume. It cannot function if if the circulatory system shuts down, it's it's done. And so if we're able to, uh, if we're able to affect change there, it has, a, it has a tremendous benefit. So this is a nationwide program now. It's done through the fire department with, in cooperation with the Red Cross. Um, like I say, it takes an hour. And we would love if you, if you wanted to put together community groups uh, in your neighborhoods, you want to put together a neighborhood meeting just for this, again, we would ask it's, it's not critical. Um, we, we want to use our resources the best we can. And so we'd love to put pressure on you to get 10 or 12 people in the room so that we can teach 10 or 12 at a time as opposed to two or three. But we'll teach anybody who asks. And uh, we, think it's a, we think it's a tremendous opportunity to, to teach our community what to do in, in the event of, you know, it could be a serious car accident, it could be anything. But, Let's face it, we're preparing. We're preparing for things that we've seen in the world that we hope don't come to Provo. Yes. Would it be for or oh, absolutely. It would be an absolute, absolutely would be appropriate for scouts. Um, it's kind of one step forward into what they already learned in their first day of merit badge and, and that. Um, like I said, it's pretty, you know, I mean, you start talking about, when you, when you think about, I don't know, there seems to be, a, you, when we talk to people, there seems to be a big difference between wrapping a wound and packing a wound. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so what we want to do is we want to teach you the things that you can do to make a tremendous difference in, uh, in the event of, of that kind of an emergency. I'll tell you one of the things that drove this and, and has driven our, there's a change to the way that we respond to events like this. Um, we now have, we now have um, SWAT paramedics. Some of our people are trained, are trained with the SWAT team. Um, we also have a, um, a system now that we work with with the police department where medics go in in the hot zone. Basically, there'll be two paramedics that will be surrounded by five guns and, and we will go in and they will secure the area as we move forward so that we can provide treatment life-saving treatment there, and then extract somebody in the event that, that they were in a hot zone. And we're training on that all the time now. So, so it's a little bit different view. They used to be at the fire department and say, hey, bring, bring them on out here. You know, we're safe, bring them on out here, and, and we got them. And we realized that between there and there, we're losing a lot of people. And so, so we have trained with the police department to actually, to actually go in with, with the response force and be able to be protected while we're providing, um, and that's a that's a paradigm change for change for firefighters too. I tell you, it wasn't uh, it was like wow, okay, it's a little weird when you're going in and you've got and you've got five police officers around you, all of which have long guns, and and uh, um, it's a little bit unnerving, but um, but it's it's great training, and it has it's it's proven to be extremely effective in our country. I think it's awesome to have this training. Has there been, has, can you think of a situation in our state where that's, like what kind of scenario? So, um, so just just uh, last year, I don't know if it was last year, I don't know, I can't remember, time just kind of escapes me, but within the last 18 months, we had five students stabbed at Mountain View High School. And uh, they, had, they all five had knife wounds, and a couple of them were serious. Even the ones that weren't life-threatening stab wounds were significant bleeds. And, and so, no, school, you're right. That's yeah. And those are the kinds of things, but it could happen in an office. I mean, I, um, it just, there just, there's enough going on in the world that we feel like we've got to, we've got to prepare better. And it could be in an office. It could be, um, uh, it just, it, it, 
just look at the world. We're, we're just a little slice of America, probably a, a little more civil slice of most of America, but we're just a slice of America. And so, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Do you have any contact for that, Jamie? You? Uh, Chris Blenzinger. It, it, again, it'll it'll be on this site. Let me give you let me give you the number. So it's 801-852-6321. You're going to reach some very kind ladies that will that will get you signed up or get you in contact with Chris Blenzinger as we start to assemble the courses. As of now, we have not started we have not started announcing a course and giving a course. We have been inundated with people who say I have 20 people who would love to take this course. We are giving this to school teachers. Uh, we've, we've, we've done this to several school uh, groups. We've done it to several office groups. We've done it to, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I wish Chris were here to share all of the groups that we've done this for, and some scout groups. Are you talking about Stop the Bleed still? Or you What's that? Talking about I'm talking about Stop the Bleed. Yeah. So, yes. So your course, and I apologize, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was clear on this, that if in fact that, you go through this, the six-week course, your CPR can be renewed whenever it needs to be renewed yeah. because you've already gone through the six-week course. Yeah. And I don't know if that anybody understands how important that is that you carry a CPR trained card and what it costs to have that renewed every year. You can do it through this program and have it renewed every year. Every so years. I appreciate that. Next on my list was CPR. And we, we give CPR classes. We, we do it we do it through cert but um, we give CPR classes and and recertification CPR classes on a fairly regular basis this is also where we make a plug for one of our most important our most important community partners and that is the Red Cross uh, Red Cross does the same thing we, we work with them if, if we're not on the right timeline for you oftentimes Red Cross is but, uh, but we are trying to strengthen our partnership. Um, Red Cross does, and it does some amazing work for us. Um, when we have a fire, doesn't matter what time, day or night, um, let me give you an example. The Finch Road fire, we had our, our, uh, the Finch fire out near um, Amelia Earhart School. We had some people that were displaced, and there were about eight of them that were displaced, and it was the middle of the night, it was freezing cold, the American Red Cross showed up, and they had clothes and vouchers, and and they fulfill a need that it's difficult for us to fulfill while we're in the while we're in the, the middle of trying to resolve the problem. And so, so um, the Red Cross is, is certainly one of our most important partners when it comes to taking care of our community in an emergency. But CPR, um, we do offer CPR on a regular basis, and again, you can sign up, you can get on. Um, CPR is also one of those courses. That I, I don't. I think we. I think we'll teach CPR if we have eight people. Um, uh, I think. I think we'll think it's eight. But like I say, we we try to. It's. It's. If you think about it, and um, if you want to have CPR, we can get you to gather up some of your friends to come with you. Then. Then we're able to teach more people. We're able to use our resources more effective, and we get more people out there trained. Yes. What was the charge for that? Twenty-five dollars. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I just said that out of school. Um, I, I believe it is. I believe it's, I believe it's 25, it's 25, maybe 29, I don't remember. Yes? It, you, you have to, there, there's, not, there's not a schedule. What we do is people, when people call and ask about it, we, Chris organizes all of that and formulates a class makes contact and now if you bring us if you bring us 12 people or 10 people then you kind of name that if you're an individual we'll gather you up with some other individuals and we'll offer a class when we can get enough people to to offer the class yes Are all the costs on the page as well um, the only the only thing um, the only thing we charge for is the CPR um, we're, we're currently not charging for stop the bleed. Um, that it's the only thing we charge for, and the reason, the only reason we charge for CPR is because it costs us to get your cards and books. Um, so it's it's not necessarily that the fire department is not this is certainly not a revenue source for the fire department. It's it's just that we have uh, um, we have um, we don't have a card we issue you. It comes to the American Heart Association. Yes, Dave. And the price for cert when I took it was like forty five bucks. 
Um, yeah, we have we have grants um, we have grants for CERT, and and Chris is doing an interesting thing. Um, here's here's what we have found, and this probably makes a lot of sense to you. If we offer you a class for free and you pay nothing for it, your commitment sometimes is less than if you paid forty-five dollars for it. So yes, there I think there may be an upfront fee, but there is a ton of stuff that you get, including the backpack and the helmet and the and flashlights and, and all kinds of stuff. So um, so I, I stand corrected. Um, there was even uh, there was even a time. In, Again, I, I, I didn't come prepared to talk about the money part of this, and I apologize. It's in 40, in case you want 40, to. okay, thank you. So $40, um, you'll get twice that, you'll get twice that back in, in materials and in equipment with your, with your backpack and your, your gloves and your flashlight and your helmet and vest and, and all of that stuff, you'll get, you'll get much more than that back. And uh, I'm gonna say, I. I, uh, I know when we used there was a time when we taught CPR where we would actually we would actually um, take your money and then at the end of the class we'd give you your money back um, just just because we found that 50 percent uh, roughly 50 or 60 percent of the people who sign up for something they didn't pay for don't show up and and so that's that's kind of the driving force behind that and and so um, I appreciate thank you for looking that up for me um, Chris could have come off like this. Um, so, uh, so those are some educational opportunities. Um, I want to let you know that, that as, as we do every year, the City of Provo is taking part in the, uh, the Great Shakeout on the 17th of April. And there is some information on the, on the state website, on our website, about what you can do. Our exercise is actually a community-wide exercise where we will, notify, we will make notification to you um, one of the things that we want to test is our notification system. And I have, I have our, there, there's a whole stack of these back there. And this is what I'd like, I, this is the whole reason I came to talk to you today. This is the most important thing to ask you to do. And that is to reach out to your neighborhoods and encourage them to, to sign up for the emergency notification, the app, sign up on the Everbridge system. There's a whole stack of these flyers over the, the whole stack of these little flyers. It has the address. You can sign up for as little or as much as you'd like, as far reaching as you'd like. Um, I, I signed up for just about everything and about the only thing I get that kind of, that, that comes at a frequency that I wish it was a little less was the emergency weather notifications. I, I find out when it's gonna snow at Sundance or I mean at, uh, at, uh, at Snowbird and and uh, they, they tell me all about the the uh, the uh, Salt Lake County the Salt Lake County mountain area, but but it does it does tell us about our county also. We just haven't had nearly the amount of alerts. Yes. Are you asking us to take those if we feel comfortable and give them out? You can you can do that, or you can if you put out an email to your group, you can just give them a little paragraph, or maybe maybe scan this in or something and let them know. But we're going to have a drill on the 17th, and we are going to simulate. Um, we're going to simulate a flooding situation, and the flooding situation is 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 it's not um, it's going to be based on a winter runoff or a spring runoff situation, and it's going to be somewhat controlled. We we try we we're trying to pick a um, the two things we want to do is notify the community and be able to provide information to the community, but ultimately. We are trying to work on our ability to evacuate part, if not much, of pro being able to, to evacuate it for a lot of different reasons. We've got a railroad that runs through town. We've got a highway that runs through town. We've got, um, we, there are some things that could cause us to need to evacuate significant amounts of people. And we want to be able to communicate with you to tell you how to do that, to tell you what's set up, and, and whether if, if, you, if you live on the east side of town, what you need to do, if you live on the west side of town, what you need to do in both north and south. Because it's gonna be different for everybody. Um, we, we're not gonna try to send everybody out of town the same way. And so we're, we're trying to set up an emergency notification system so that we can let you know that there is, um, and typically what this would be is, here there is a notification 
we need you to we need you to listen, we need you to go to get this information, we need you to know what it is that we are asking you to do so that you can evacuate the community if in fact we need to. Um, and uh, we have made some, um, uh, Dave Decker was making some, some comments about the, about the flooding and about the dikes along the Provo River and we've had some great conversation with with the people of water resources over the last couple of years about what that means and what kind of capacity we have up up in the reservoirs and, and, and the kind of safeguards that they take to make sure that we have capacity and um, and we feel we feel more and more confident about their ability to control that um, and uh, but but there are there are weird things that happen it could be localized flooding it could be um, it, it could be a train train issue. It could be um, some other sort of threat. Yes, Dave. South State Street, they went in on time and opened up the natural gas tank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They just that's a that's a great uh, great example. They just did that in Salt Lake City. If you saw that, they just evacuated about 400 people in Salt Lake City out of out of the downtown area because they had a major gas leak. So, so yes. Have you heard about what? Uh, I what what the fluoride in the water? Oh yes, yes. I, I just thought that's a very good point. Of that's why a, we need. yeah. It's a very good. It's a very good example of why notification. Um, if you know you don't want to wait till five o'clock on the news to hear this, and you don't want to take what they say as gospel, and and so um, it's. Um, or do you want me to do it? No, no, no. So uh, I just, I know that they, we, we test, and, and Dave, you speak to this, we test water at, um, at several locations. How often do we do that, Dave? Uh, we have about 125 bacteria tests every month. So, so they had, um, I'm, I'm assuming just one of their tests went bad. I didn't follow the story. Oh, okay, sorry. I just heard about this on Monday. So in Sandy, what happened is they were they were actually going to some of their well houses that were, were closed down, that they didn't use them anymore, and they were testing those, and one of them got left on, and so fluoride started seeping into the water. And since fluoride actually is a dangerous chemical in large quantity that was starting to make some people sick, they didn't know what was going on at the time. They didn't think it affected a lot of people, so they didn't notify at first, but when they found out the problem, they realized that this was affecting more people than it needed to. So they started trying to send out emergency notifications, but they realized that their emergency contact notification wasn't getting to the people who needed to get to. So then they had to start knocking doors and sending flyers around and telling people, okay, these are the procedures that you need to do. Don't drink out of your tap. Or once they got the fire shut off, they had to flush their water systems in their houses. But this emergency, contact in our city can be really helpful for that if we can get everybody on it. So you send out instructions of flush your houses so that you don't you know, get sick from overflowing. But that's what happened in Sandy. So now they're trying to revamp all of their stuff so that they can be on a better system. I, I can't think of a single reason why you would not want to get some of these notifications. Um, they're, they're not, like I say, they're, they're, uh, they're not annoying. They don't come very often. We will test it on the 17th. You will actually get a test. Um, we'll, we'll send something out. We tested it three weeks ago, maybe. Um, we did a little test uh, on it, and we will do that again as part of our process. And, uh, but our goal, is to, our goal is to increase subscription, if you will, to this by 20% this year. Try to get, and, and, that's, and that's about, in Provo, that's about 7,000 people is what we hope to be able to, 7,000 new registrants we hope to be able to get on, on every bridge. Did you have a question? Is it certified zip code or neighborhood? How do they know? It's actually set up by, it's actually set, it's actually set up on maps. So you can, you can bring, you can, you can do an overlay and it will grab every number that's registered in that area. No, they're, they're not. So you're going to go on. So I, I, again, I, that would have been a great idea. You go on the website. It says enter your address and all of that. And then it says, what do you want to know about? And you just check the boxes. And you want to know about them in Utah County. You want to know about them in Wasatch County, you know, wherever. 
I've got a couple, I've got, I've got kids out in the basin. I've got a daughter and, and son-in-law and five grandkids out in the basin. So I get the basin alerts too. Um, and so that's kind of, um, uh, that's what it's used for. But no, it's, it's very, very intuitive and it will. Is there text alerts or? There, there, you can have it any way you want. You can, have a, you can have a phone call, you can have a text alert, you can, have, you can choose the different venues that you get them. And uh, like I said, very simple to set up and um, very beneficial, very beneficial. All right. Karen's gonna, here we go. So, so this is, this is uh, she, she's got all this information already filled out. But this will, it'll ask you to fill out this information. You can have it sent to cell phones. You can have it sent to, to home phones if you have one of those. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and emails. I, I get email alerts also. So um, anyway, it's, it's a, it, is, it is the method. It is the method for you to be notified of an emergency. And you know, I, how many of you are aware of the fact that the sirens along the river bottom no longer exist? They no longer exist. There was a they, there was a, a significant problem in in a maintenance problem in all of them. They were very old. Um, we were talking about updating them when we got the four hundred thousand dollar price tag. We thought that's not an effective way to spend four hundred thousand dollars to notify anyone. And because most people, um, like you say, you don't hear them in your cars. You don't hear them. Um, necessarily in your homes very far away, you know, the trees have grown up, grown up, and yes. So maybe you don't know this, I don't know who might be able to answer this, but I know a lot of us are getting worried about giving our phone numbers out. I'm going to sell this, my yeah. phone number now to somebody else. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is, this is as safe as it gets. This is as safe as it gets when you, um, this is, this is, um, I can't tell you all of the safeguards, but this is not that kind of data. And uh, this is for emergency notification purposes only. So who's running this site? Well, it's, 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 uh, there is somebody in every location that is responsible for their own information, but it's, it's called Everbridge. And it's a system that was set up and purchased by the state of Utah and several other states too. But, um, but it, is, it, is, uh, it is a product that was purchased um, and, and is, is being run throughout Utah. Um, so the last thing, <clears throat> the last thing we left on the back was a stack of just just some uh, information on the 96-hour emergency kit. Now we may have moved the ball a little bit here because it used to be a 72-hour kit, um, but uh, we're finding we're finding that um, if we if our goal is a 96-hour kit. And we have the things that are on this list, and the things that are on here that are important to you, then uh, then you will be prepared in the event that something happens. Um, one of the most one of the most difficult things to deal with in emergency management are people that don't have medications. So if you have medications, um, if you have medications, there 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 are ways that you can go through and you can get. Uh, an extra 30 days of medication, or um, you can actually approach your insurance company. They're, they're, some are doing that more and more often now. Um, you can, you know, you can set some aside. Um, we, our, our advice is, if there is anything that you absolutely have to have that you can't do without for four or five days, you need to have that ready to go, along with your car keys and your eyeglasses and all of that. Medications are the most difficult thing for us to deal with in an evacuation situation, especially when we get to a shelter. And say, how many people don't have medications that they need? And then you just want to go, what, what are we going to do about that? And uh, fortunately, we, we do have ways to work through it, but it is difficult. So any other questions for me? Yes? I guess part of my question when you're talking about emergency preparedness, if there's an earthquake tomorrow, I'm at home, what are the company neighbors to do? No, and, and, and you won't you won't be able to. So if, if we have an earthquake, um, you know you can do the search for us, correct? Okay. Um, if 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 we have an earthquake, um, the very first thing we want to do is take cover. And once the earth has stopped shaking, we we want to try to evaluate whether where we are is safe. And um, 
And again, we there is information. There is information on these on this site about earthquakes and about the steps to take after that. Um, you know, we want to do things like uh, immediately. We if the very first thing I would after you make sure everybody's safe and the bleeding is stopped and and all of that is to shut off natural gas to your residents. Um, like I say, there's a list of things that you can do, um, but um, but. Preparation. There, there is no substitute for being prepared. I guess part of my question though is, so if I were to take a sort of class, and are you relying on those people in those neighborhoods that take those? They're suddenly the captains. Um, they know they're not. They're not captains. But here's the mission of CERT: take care of yourself and your family. Once that's been done, take care of your neighbors. And once that's been done, come where we've asked you to come and take and be part of the greater good. So there's no assignment necessarily. It's just you spend a lot of time getting educated. And and uh, and there may come a time where we'd like to organize this in such a way that um, that uh, that we can utilize CERT more effectively for like large area searches and getting information out about lost children and and responding to different types of emergencies. Um, we, would, we would like to at some point maybe expand to that. Yes. So uh, years ago, I took a class the class CERT training with Chris. Uh -huh. And I don't know if this still holds true or not, but I'm very curious about it. He indicated that when FEMA comes in, if we had a major earthquake or something, when FEMA comes in, they will only recognize CERT. They won't recognize the state president, whatever the church has going on. They really do need the CERT, CERT certification and set up some type of post so that when FEMA comes through, they will talk to you. Is that correct? Is that still moving true? I'm not sure what it means by talk to you, but as far as gathering people to do emergency work, yes. yes. That's yes. what I mean. I'm sorry. Are yes, you... yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they, they uh, that's where they would start. Right. I think it would depend on the, the scope of the emergency and what they needed, but that's where they would start. Yeah, so Chris encouraged me that all neighborhood chairs should be certain certified. Oh, I, th I think that would be that would be fabulous. And if we wanted to do a neighborhood chair, if we wanted to do a class just for neighborhood chairs, we certainly could do that. We certainly could do that. All right. Thank you so much for your Saturday morning. Uh, again, I, I took more time than I think I was allotted, but I'm grateful for the conversation. And if there's anything that you need, you can contact the fire department. And please feel free to contact me if there's anything that I can do for you. Have a great Saturday. Um, just wanted to give you a few updates. Um, the council uh, recently passed a boundary change. They approved this boundary change between the river bottoms and North Tipview neighborhoods. Um, this one came about just as a matter of logically looking at where people are in the neighborhood and, and who logically is kind of belongs together. I know most of the time we look at a flat map and it's hard to tell and we, and, you know, sometimes those lines are drawn in interesting places that are logical on a flat map. But uh, when you get the contours in there or you see where where housing is built up, we had a uh, one, was it two years ago, Lakeview North and Lakeview South, we made an adjustment because the people would be kind of orphaned if they were left where they were <laughs> in the one neighborhood, but um, by roping them into the southern one, it worked out really well. So when you see those kinds of things, not that we look to change the map a lot, but um, it just shows that, hey, you're on the ground, you see what's logical and not logical, and we, you know, we want to help where we can. Um, and I've updated you on the, um, the change to having one to three vice chairs. If you have more than that right now, like Vicki, you don't have to get rid of everybody. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, next time around with the elections, we'll, we'll have those limits. Now this doesn't mean you can't work as a committee. There's a lot you can do. It's just that on the, the kind of more official side of chairs and vice chairs. The vice chairs are more authorized to step in for you and speak for you if you're out of town or unavailable. But uh, 
make good use of other people as assistant chairs, just you know, round up people. It's also a good way to use people for one project, try them out, see how they work with you, and then um, see if you want them on another project. It's a lot harder to get rid of a vice chair. <laughs> we have had some personality conflicts, and and I, and that's really rough. Um, the, the chair is still the top voice in the neighborhood. That's who the, the residents elect. Um, we hope everyone will get along with their vice chairs. We realize there's a lot of different opinions, a lot of different points of view, and that's great. Bring them all to the table, but in the end, as a chair, you're going to be the main voice coming forward, and, and uh, we'll find a way to work together. Please come to me if you have issues. Um, don't reach out to the mayor's office because she's not involved in the neighborhood program and can't, can't address those kinds of issues. If you have an issue, come to me. If you can't come to me, please come to Cliff, come to a council member. They can um, help you sort through those kinds of things best. Sorry, I just, I just want to say something about this real quick. We, we talked about this at our NAB meeting of a neighborhood advisory board meeting, and it's not to try and cut anybody out of the process because regardless of whether you're a neighborhood chair, vice chair, assistant chair on a neighborhood committee, or even just a member of your community, everybody's welcome to council meetings, everybody's welcome to say their opinions and to say what they feel. I mean, this is not to cut anybody out, it's just to kind of keep the organization a little bit better. Because a lot of people who want to come and be a vice chair maybe have just one really hot topic that they want to be a part of, and they're not really interested in helping with a lot of other stuff. They just have that one goal in their in their mind. So that would be a great person to have on a neighborhood committee to head up that project and to bring it to the neighborhood chair. All the information that they gather to the neighborhood chair can present to council. Again, assistant chairs. I have an assistant chair in my neighborhood because he really doesn't want to be a vice chair, but he's there and he wants to help the neighborhood, so he's my assistant chair. It, this is, again, it's not to cut anybody out of the process. It's just to kind of keep the organization a little bit easier to end the trails a little bit to fall, to be easier to fall. Um, and then hopefully everyone, especially now that I've gone through the list again and, and have double checked to make sure I've got everybody's email on the list, sorry Beth. Um, I've been sending out a weekly email with extra information, training, tips on things. Um, oh good. <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying them. Um, I found out that even people who've been doing this for a very long time um, had forgotten that we had a neighborhood program manual that I've put online. And yes, I know it's hard to feel like you really want to go and look through all that great information. So I figured little bites, little bits at a time. If there's particular topics you're interested in, shoot me a text or an email, uh, you know, because I'm always wondering what am I going to do for the next one. Um, I have the next one programmed and ready to go for Monday, but, uh, but uh, you know, I'm always open to ideas because I don't know what you don't know yet. <laughs> And, and actually, I learned a lot from tracking down the stuff you're interested in. Okay, so um, what I want you to do, um, when we talked about limiting the number of vice chairs, uh, there was a discussion um, in the council meeting about should we change the number of years or limit the number of terms that a neighborhood chair serves? Now, um, I look back, it used to be two years and now it's four years. I don't know how many times it's changed back and forth. Um, in looking back through history that, that had been documented and handed over to me, it looks like people serve all kinds of numbers of years there, there are a lot of people that move after a year or two, and so new election. There are plenty of people that serve three or four years. Then I noticed there were plenty of people who seem to have six, seven, or ten year terms just because we don't get around to running another election. Um, and some, over the course of many elections, have served 10, 15, 20 years. I think the one who's been in the longest currently might be Brian. He's at 15, 16 years, I think. 
18th, unless, Marion, have you been, I can't remember, I forgot I to look. I started out as assistant. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And, and I noticed that a lot, a lot of um, starting in as, as an assistant or a vice chair and then moving up. So kind of what I want you to do at your tables is, is have a discussion, see what you think. I mean, is one of the reasons for the two years um, going away and changing to four years was that it just seemed like you barely get going and, and you know what you're doing and then you're up for election again. Also, there's one of me, although we, we have changed it so the Neighborhood Advisory Board can help out with elections, but 34 neighborhoods changing leadership or, or having elections every two years. <laughs> it's hard to keep up, it really is. So, um, so maybe three years is better. Is four years too long? The thing I want to point out is this is not a sentence, people. <laughs> if you have changes in your life and you need to step away, please say something. Um, we, you know, we've, we've had people step down because of health and they will designate a vice chair until we can have an election. They'll say, oh, I want this vice chair to step up for me until we can have a new election. Um, we, you know, please don't, don't suffer out there needlessly. If there's, if there's a need for you to step down, there's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But, um, but I'd rather that than have you not doing anything and kind of hiding away from us because, you know, your neighborhood needs you. Uh, in, in watching Orem dissolve its neighborhood program, I feel for them because, yes, they have neighborhood boundaries, but there's no one designated in each of those neighborhoods to watch out for them. And you're, it's amazing what you do. And, and you don't get enough thanks for that, to, to be the ones watching those agendas, looking for those things coming up and saying, hey neighbors, <laughs> did you notice this? Bonnie. Why was it dissolved? Um, a part of it was it was, it was hard for them to keep up with it in a lot of ways. And they had, loosely organized um, some of their structure around uh, uh, LDS church boundaries and things. And I, don't, I think they just never got it solidly in place. Dave. Did they say they thought they communicated next week? Oh, Facebook that too. They, they, yeah, they said that they didn't feel like it was any better communication than what they could do with Facebook, with emails, that kind of thing. Now, I've watched and I know that you guys reach out so much more than what any of us can do on Facebook and emails. Um, I've watched many of you go door to door and even just putting up signs for things. You go above and beyond just my little technological blip of trying to throw information out there. So. Um, I don't want to become, you know, this stagnant program, and, and part of that is keeping you guys going, and so even if you have to take a break for a little bit and have someone else fill in, whatever, but please say something. <laughs> um, I don't want any of you out there feeling like, oh, two more years, you know, I mean, it, <laughs> it's not fun. And, you know, and I, I've, I've experienced job changes that totally flipped my world, too, so. Um, so, also, oh, yeah. Sorry, just a quick question. Is it just like how long the term is, or are we also looking at how many terms you can Um, I don't really want to address how many terms because the reason, I, the reason I don't is because if people will actually show up that are concerned that someone's been in too long, if they will actually show up and vote, they can change that. I have yet to see enough people, well, Joaquin probably had the biggest turnout I've ever seen, and they were effective in making their voices heard. Um, they, they changed the situation <coughs> to what they wanted. Um, but I have, most of the time, it's two people, 
five people, 10 people, um, occasionally 30 or 40 people. But um, I've been at ones where we had to hold another election meeting because the two people who show up say, not it. <laughs> and, and I get to start over. So I don't think there's anything preventing the average resident from being able to overthrow you at the next election if they don't like you. They just have to get people to show up. Dave? So I didn't see it on your agenda. I know it was appropriate while we have everyone together uh -huh. to mention that in the past we have sent one or two or maybe even three uh, neighborhood chairs to <coughs> the new sub organization that is a nationwide neighborhood organization that if you want to learn how to be the greatest neighborhood chair ever, that's where you go. Um, and what? Uh, yeah, how much does it cost and who's funded it? We, we have funded, the council has funded it in the past. Yeah, so NUSA is Neighborhoods USA, um, and they have a big meeting every year, lots of workshops. In the, in the past, we've sent, um, I've been once now, I know Louise went several times, council members have gone, and neighborhood chairs have gone. Um, we've dialed it back as, you know, expenses, you know, we, we try to cut back where we can, but it's not something we've truly eliminated. So this is something that if you feel like it's beneficial to you to get more training and in different ways to run neighborhoods. Now, we're unique because this is under the government. In other places, they're really having to fight the government to organize as a neighborhood and, and bring their issues forward. Um, so sometimes it's, it's interesting to see that fighter mentality <laughs> in some of them, but they also are great. They'll teach you about organizing different activities, um, the best way to reach out to your residents, um, how to talk to government, um, and they have even a lot of grant writing workshops and things like that. So um, if that's something you're interested in, we haven't reached out for a while, but, but it's good to know if this is something you are interested in. So I, there's a, a sheet of paper on each table to, to do the, yes, to do the area elections, but there's an area for notes down there. So give your opinions on, on the, the number of years for a neighborhood chair term, and then tell us what you think about going to an event like NUSA, um, if that's something that interests you or you think we should continue to do. Um, and the council office has paid for that in the past, so it, it wouldn't come out of your pocket necessarily, unless you want to sponsor yourself. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, on the area reps, we do this every year, elect new area representatives. Um, that's why we wanted to have you seat yourselves by area. Um, we did have a change where an area rep or assistant area rep could be a vice chair rather than just a chair, but it has to be with your chair's permission because we don't want this to kind of undermine what's going on in your neighborhood as far as leadership. Um, you just serve a year at a time, you'd be part of the neighborhood advisory board. Um, the, just the area reps go to the neighborhood advisory board meetings, which are scheduled pretty much as needed, and we've had them every, what, three months or so, roughly. Um, and, and we like for the area reps to serve kind of as a mentor or, or helper to the chairs in their area. Um, I can't get to everybody sometimes, and it's nice to have the area reps show up at the other neighborhood meetings. So I'm gonna turn it over to you to select someone, our Northwest area, we're gonna to have to do by email again. There, <laughs> there are a bunch of, they, it's hard, we only have four neighborhoods in the Northwest area, so, and they're all incredibly busy and I have a tough time tracking them down. But for the rest of you, if you can go ahead and take a couple minutes to, there's no real formal way to vote. 
please let it be someone who's willing. It, you don't have to change if you don't want to. I know at the Northeast area, Mike Rome is the current one, and he couldn't be here, but he said he's still willing. So, have at it. <laughs> now, not everyone that okay, I'm gonna cut you guys off here. The the biggest thing I have ended up getting questions about and, and requests for training on is how to hold a neighborhood meeting on a land use application, also known as how to hold a neighborhood meeting with a developer. Um, so. I've got handouts on the table uh, that show you kind of the process that we should be following. This is how it is in the code. Um, hopefully it makes sense. It's our code can be really crazy to navigate, so let me know if you have questions on that. The neighborhood meetings are required when you have zone changes or a general plan amendment, unless it's citywide, in which case it doesn't require a neighborhood meeting, but uh, I've, if you want to hold one, let me know so I can get it in the computer, Paul. Now when you say require, what you're saying is that it's required that notice be given for the opportunity to have a neighborhood meeting, not that a neighborhood meeting actually be held. Nope, it's required to hold the meeting. We we actually have kind of fine tuned that to make it. To make it it used to be that that neighborhood chairs could waive it if they wanted to. We took that part out about them waiving it because you're supposed to have them, but there is nothing we can actually do if you don't. So. It's one of those. Like, like I said. It's or else. <laughs> you will hold the meeting or else. You can fire So, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, why this is important as far as deciding to hold that neighborhood meeting is if you don't let us know within that 14 day period that's on there that you're going to hold a neighborhood meeting, then um, then the developer can move on. Their application doesn't get held up because we can't just keep holding them up in our system because you haven't made up your mind yet. If you know that you're not going to hold one, um, there's nothing I can do, but at least I can free up that developer um, to move along the line. Marion? Well, what if the developer never contacts you? Can I have that happen? Um, yeah, and there's actually no punishment for them either unfortunately, but we'll look at them really bad. I don't know. Um, no, that's been one of my things, and that's why I want, I'd like to have you start reaching out more to the planner and say, hey, I haven't heard from this developer. I got the notice from you, but I haven't heard from the developer. Because um, there's nothing I can do on my part other than I can put a note in the computer system. But um, it's good for the planner to know that the contact isn't made because they're required by code to reach out to you. There aren't a lot of consequences, but if we can say, um, council, it, this developer never reached out to the neighborhood, then I guess council can frown at them. I, I, I don't know what would exactly happen. Um, this is the tough thing with the way the code is, but that's why when this topic came up, I asked Kate Van Buren to speak because um, unless, if you're not aware, he does a lot of work in the construction business. He's also a city councilman. He's also been one of you in the neighborhood program. He's been at a lot of different neighborhood meetings with developers. He's seen these things. He's, he's experienced it. And I think he can speak to you on kind of those best practices, what, what he's looking for as a council member and, and kind of how this works a little better than I can because I'm not the decision maker and where, where he is one now, I think he can give a lot of advice there. I'm going to, I need his desk, so I'm not going to speak at that mic, is that okay? Can you okay. hear all right if we just talk? Speak loud then. Um, and Kara set it up pretty well. Before we just go right to those kind of things, I'd like to just talk for a second about trust. Um, it's been said that if you remove if you remove trust, you can destroy by any organization. If you develop trust, you can make any organization successful. And 
So there's a few things we talk about. How do, how do we how do we develop trust? And again, put it in the concept in the context of this development meetings with developers and development of our city, not not generally. Okay. So first of all, let's talk straight. So say what you mean, mean what you say, and also ask your uh, developer to do the same. And your your meetings, your your citizens, your people, your neighborhoods to come and talk. And we just talk straight, so that we're not trying to pull anything over. We're talking straight. And then we demonstrate respect. And you've all been in meetings when that's questionable. We try to keep that up, but doesn't always happen. So if we can be respectful of each other, so we can talk straight. Um, transparency, right wrongs. And once in a while, wrong things are done. And rather than trying to defend our wrong things, just make them right. Go forward. It makes it a lot easier. Um, show some loyalty. Now, I don't know where your loyalties are. I think as a neighborhood chair, you're probably loyal to your neighborhood and the people you represent there. And, and show that loyalty by defending and explaining and asking. Um, did deliver results. And the last one it talked about is saying getting better. So how do we get better? And t t for our conversation today, and I won't be very long. I just want to. I want to ask a couple questions. It says, as you, as you think about your neighborhood meetings with developers, what's one thing we're now doing that you think we should continue doing? So what are you doing in these meetings right now that works well and you think we ought to keep doing? Is there anything that jumps out? Okay. Well, I appreciate the developers when they have a presentation that shows what the thing is going to look like. Usually it's a housing project, uh, the price range, the target of the buyers, um, landscaping uh, considerations for traffic and so on, and that they take comments from the neighbors. Very good. And I think most, most developers want to give you something physical to see because it's hard to, they say, oh, we're going to do this building or this house or these many houses unless you see really what they're doing. Now, the flip side of that, a developer has to spend money to do that. So they have to reach a balancing point, okay, what's the investment I need to make to communicate my ideas well? But then, if it's turned down, it's just not money that I'm burning. So then there's always that balance. But, uh, but I think it, there needs to be some feature part. Yeah, I appreciate when they bring uh, how it fits in the neighborhood. So I don't just walk in and say, well, it's a 35 foot building. Well, what is everything around it? So I know how this fits next to it. And I appreciate when they come and say, this is, like you said, I appreciate that you're spending money to get to this point, but this isn't set in stone. And so I'm willing to make some changes to the neighborhood. Exactly. Um, I, I found that I, I really appreciate when community development does put the uh, contractor in contact with me. And one of the key issues is know, know the issues in your area and know where the property is that they're talking about. I have one particular property and I, I've had now three developers. It has changed hands three times. I said, do you understand that that property across the street from you is a drug rehab center? Oh, no, nobody told me that. The realtor didn't even tell me that. I said, do you understand that we have issues with connections to the sewer line right now, and that is yet to be resolved and it's come, uh, come first, first by uh, first come first. Knowing the issues on the west side and what's happening in the area and truly what your neighbors are, are looking for, you're talking about uh, trust. And I had one developer say, you know, I have not had anybody, even from the city, tell me all of the issues in the area. Thank you for, for explaining this. And it never came up. And they, 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 they've <laughs> changed three three times now, three different developers for that single piece of property. I, I think it's uh, helpful that that you know the issues in your area. Good, good comment. Relating just that a little bit, the council has struggled a little bit in your area, the west side of town, mm -hmm. to know what we're telling developers. Because we have, but now there's a map that's, that's fairly clear. Yep. And we can give it to them say, you're just not going to be able to get sewer in this area. So yep. you can buy the property and you can sit on it for a while, but nothing's going to happen. But, but it took us a while to get there. And I know that was frustrating. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> I had a developer come and talk to me 
and they assumed that was the neighborhood meeting. <laughs> and uh, because they didn't show up to the neighborhood meeting. And then I noticed months later that they had started construction, and I was like, what? Really? That's. Yeah. I think. Uh, <coughs> I've had that. Yeah, it's scary. So far, it's not. Yes, go ahead. I, I've had developers try that with me too, is that I've talked to the neighborhood chair that constitutes a neighborhood meeting, but if you if you or your vice chairs or always have somebody, if you can, be at the planning commission or at the city council meeting, I know it's But then I didn't, nobody told me that he was meeting with the planning commission. I, I never got well, any notification. Yeah, the planning commission notification I had spotted on. I haven't received notices that they, they go to planning commission some, but city council agenda, Karen always gets the city council agenda out. If there's anything relating to my area, I try to be there. Um, I know it's frustrating for city council members sometimes when they're like, oh, this seems like a very big item, but there's no neighborhood representation there to speak to them about what's going on. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. The developers are, are thinking they have this set standard when you're sitting going, no, no, you didn't meet what the standard committee is. And on the flip side, us as neighborhood chairs, we have a set standard that if we're not meeting that standard, we're yeah, I never got any notification that it was Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah notification for neighborhood chairs, they know about council meetings when an issue from their area is going to. Is that something that we can get a lot of send out? So, yes. <laughs> so, Elizabeth in, in our office back there, also a matching grants person, um, she sends out the council agendas. Um, and on, on ones that are land use, it says the neighborhood for those items. The hard thing is planning commission things come from community development um, and probably soon, I can't remember. But you can sign up on community community development. development because I get all of their Well, they, they send them to all the neighborhood chairs. No, since Rachel started, she has there's been some communication gaps in the last couple of months. So, just, just so, you're yeah. so if if you're not receiving those planning commission agendas, let me know and I'll let or or call community development. The problem is we can't tell community development what to do because the council office is very separate from the rest of the city government. Um, and we all handle things differently, honestly. But if there's a gap that you know of, of course, you're <laughs> only the ones you know of, let me know and we'll see what we can work out. We've been trying to be better about that, Dave. The name I'm seeing is Rachel Green. Yeah, yeah, she's the one who sends those out. And I was just saying, like, if you notice that gap, I just emailed her and said, hey, I want to get those. I've gotten all. Right now, she's supposed to be set. I've created a single address, kind of like I did the council of purple.org. I've got a single address work so that I can be updating all of you guys' addresses. Um, and, and so we send it to that one. And Elizabeth is doing the same thing. She's sending the agendas to that address rather than single addresses. But please let me know if you're seeing gaps there. <laughs> So, so I think we can say, one of the questions here is, is what is one thing we're not doing do you think we should start doing? So maybe we need to make sure that communication happens, whether it be the planning commission sends to the council office the agenda, we just forward that from our office, or would it be contact the planning commission and they just deal with it directly? So on that level, and I don't know, for me this goes back to the realtor who sold this property all kinds of local promises. I don't know if realtors are right. licensed by the state or the city or the county, but it seems like we need to be training our realtors better to look at what's, what they can really do. And I know their job is to get that property sold. And so maybe they don't want to tell all that in their interest. But, but the, it is in law that they're supposed to do law. <coughs> so, so maybe we need to be making that training better. I don't know as a council that we have responsibility to train the realtors. Well, not you as a council. There's, there's, there's so many of them, and there's all kinds of them. There's ones that vary a couple right. Commercial, good, honest, honest, and do what they're supposed to be. There's also just one. And I, I'm sorry, but I, I agree. But it's hard to do, though. But it's 
we still can reach out once it gets to the a developers making a proposal. We can we can do all we can do. There. We all get inundated by emails of all kinds. I wish there was some kind of red highlighted that says Edgemont neighborhood. This is you know this is going to be on the planning process. That means to get a written notice. I don't get that anymore. And I have slipped up because I just didn't see it. How I'll we, take that How on. can we solve that one here? Thank you. That means me. I mean, um, some of the things that we do send, like the, the notices on actual land use applications, they're automated now as part of the city view system. And um, fairly soon, hopefully by the end of the year, there will be a public portal where you'll be able to go in and look at more of the supporting materials for each of those applications. Um, don't hold me to the timeline because this Provo 360 thing has been a bear. Um, but uh, it automatically generates that, that little email that you get. So I don't know how much more customization they can get, but if it's something you want, I'm happy to bug you one more time, but that means you have to actually open my email. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, if there's a way that I can alert you in that, hold on, Bonnie. One thing that I think that would be helpful um, going into the future and historically is if you had a grid, so like North Tenview, and then it listed every, you know, like you're asking how many neighborhood meetings have you had? Well, I don't know, you've had so many, but some of them are joined. Right. You know? But if it was listed, North Tenview in January, February, March, April, these are all of the meetings that they attended, and then the ones going forward, so it was just. You know, like, if you do it for a city council, because I've seen, but if it was just each individual neighborhood, I don't even know if there's a program for that or not, where it's trailing where we've been and where we're going, so that city planning and zoning, they just go straight into the neighborhood and dump it in there. And then as a neighborhood chair, we could just look at the column and say, okay, this is what's on the docket for March. This is what's on for April. This is what's on because they have to give notice. It's so hard to sift through all of the emails, like, and oh, they're doing this, they're doing that, and then of course you write right. a rabbit hole because Pinterest sent me something. And <laughs> so, it, it, it was just one place that we could go look at and see, this is what I've got going on in April, you know, or as far out as we could go. And then leave the trail up so we could see, okay, yeah, this is what your deputy does. Well, that sounds like a good thing we could actually probably bring to the neighborhood advisory board to see, kind of brainstorm and see what they can come up with. Otherwise, I can try to come up with a way that maybe the subject line tells you more to open it, hopefully. Of course, that doesn't help with citywide impact. Thank yeah, citywide, and, and that's the tough thing. Citywide, it cancels out the requirement for a meeting, so then you just have the, I mean, if you schedule a meeting, great, but there's no requirement. I just want to caution you guys one thing on the citywide, because I know of a developer who used a citywide application in a different neighborhood to get a development done in my neighborhood that the neighborhood was seriously against. What? That's so perfect. Yeah, that should be. That's great. Well, the other thing is citywide. It applied to that neighborhood. Yeah. It was pertinent for that, and it worked in that situation. But the rippling effect was that in my neighborhood, we got the development that we wanted, that we fought over for 10 years, and came to an agreement on. And then that agreement got tossed out the window because the citywide application changed. And, and that is the thing you have to pay attention to with anything citywide, is that Citywide just generally means they're changing something in an ordinance that applies citywide, even if maybe the only place that may happen is your neighborhood. Um, 